Hello, and welcome to Storytelling Animals, a Green New Books podcast of climate, ecology, and animal justice. I am your host, Dayton Martindale, and my guest today is Mark Bittman. Uh, he is the author last year of Animal Vegetable Junk, a history of food from sustainable to suicidal, a fierce indictment of our current industrial food system, how it came to be this way, and where it might go from here. Mark is the author of more than 30 books. He wrote a food column for the New York Times for many years, uh, nearly 200 columns. He also taught a class on the craft of the opinion essay a few years ago at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism, where I was fortunate enough to be a student. So I was excited to have Mark come on the show, and I was excited to do an episode on food and agriculture. Our agricultural system is a major destroyer of wild habitat. It releases greenhouse gases and contributes to climate change, uh, pollutes the air and water of the people who live near big farms, um, and it's you know it, it tortures, confines, and kills billions and billions of non-human animals, and all to produce food that, in many cases, is making us less healthy. Um, The two leading causes of death in the United States are heart disease followed by cancer. And obviously, not all of this is directly contributable to food, Um, but a fair portion of it is. And it's not enough to simply say, hey, people, eat better. Because as Mark and I talk about, the entire government subsidy structure and agricultural system is set up to produce food that either destroys the earth and or can contribute to heart disease or certain cancers or abuses and exploits animals. Why? Because this is the type of food that, right now anyway, makes money. So to fight all this, we need agricultural policy that grows food more sustainably, that makes different foods more affordable, convenient, uh, accessible, that takes land out of the hands of certain corporations and distributes it to a more diverse set of people interested in growing foods uh, through more ecological methods. Um, It means we need a better public health infrastructure. It means we need new economic policies where People can access uh, food-related jobs if they want them or where they have the money and or time to obtain and cook foods that are, again, more sustainably grown and healthier. And I could go on because as Mark begins his quote with, or his book, with a quote from John Muir, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Food is no different. In fact, food might be a prime example of this, where it's, in a way, one of the most fundamental things to being a an animal on this planet is we need to nourish ourselves. And so how we do that um, is going to be ultimately connected to a lot of other issues. So yeah, here we go. Good to see you too. So the the book we want to talk about is Animal Vegetable Junk, A History of Food from Sustainable to Suicidal. Uh, you can sort of tell from the title that you are not a big fan of the current industrial agricultural system that we have. Um, you know, just to orient people, because it, it does have its defenders, even some among people who consider themselves progressives or socialists or who's, you know profess to care about climate change and issues like that, who will say stuff like, hey, the you know industrial ag can bring us higher yields. It puts fewer people in the, you know, quote unquote, drudgery of farm work, or it brings cheaper food. Um, so what's, maybe just 
uh, back up a bit and say like, what is the problem with our current food system in the big picture? And we'll get to specifics later. I mean, I think the current, the major problem is that yields are used to measure success. Mm -hmm. uh, and pretty much yield and profit are the only numbers that, that measure success in industrial production of food. But yield, yield per acre, I mean, I wouldn't say it doesn't matter, but it's not the best measure of whether agriculture is going well or not if you're at the same time, if you're not measuring destruction per acre or, or problems <laughs> per acre uh, or use of resources per acre. Um, the other thing is I just noticed this the other day that uh, the same number of people are hungry in the world as were hungry in the world 10 and 20 years ago. And yet there are many, many more people. So uh, a billion people or a little less than a billion people are malnourished or starving or, or uh, hungry. And um, that number hasn't changed with population. So I, yield, yield has gone up. We continue to feed people who have money. Um, but if you don't have money, it doesn't matter what yield is. You still can't buy food. So that's one problem with using yield as a measure of success. Um, another is using calories as a measure of success because mm -hmm. we know now that there are calories that are good for you and calories that are not good for you. And while there is an argument that a calorie is a calorie and it's a tr that is true, strictly speaking, um, because a calorie is a, a, a measurement of energy uh, and that doesn't change, different kinds of food that have the same calories can affect your body differently. So if you say... There is enough food to feed everybody in the world, according to the United Nations, on a per calorie basis. That is true. That is that is actually true. So it doesn't need to be hunger. That's a poverty issue. But at the same time, you can be not hungry and be malnourished. And you can be malnourished by eating calories that are not good for you. Um, the other thing is that we can we can produce calories in a way that harms the environment or we can produce calories in a way that has less impact on the environment everything is everything is going to have environmental impact there's no sort of there's no sort of non-impact way of doing agriculture but you can have a horribly catastrophic impact on the environment on soil on public health on on uh carcinogens, uh, and so on, on even lifespan by, by growing certain foods, or you can, you can help people live longer, healthier lives. You can support soil health. You can do less environmental damage. You can contribute less to climate change and so on. Those are choices that can be made. And one thing I like to say these days is that we have spent well over a hundred years, close to 150 years, supporting the production of uh let's say less than ideal food and doing and doing less than ideal agriculture and you could say destructive agriculture to produce bad food we have we have government subsidies to do that kind of agriculture and to produce that kind of food and we could just as easily have government subsidies subsidies for good agriculture and more nutritious food, more affordable and more nutritious food. So these are choices that we make. And the choices mm -hmm. that we make to define successful agriculture by profit is the fundamental choice that determines how screwed up everything is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Later on, I want to kind of get into what are some of the better choices uh, we could be making. Um, but first, maybe talk about how we got here because uh, the book goes back way longer than 150 years. It starts even, you know, well before the development of agriculture. Um, but like you were saying, sort of a, a common theme throughout this whole history is when food becomes something that is primarily grown so people can sell it or trade it or, or profit from it rather than primarily grown to feed people, um, that's when bad things tend to happen. So one... Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to 
say that one thing I, when people say, why'd you write this book? One of my answers is I wrote this book because I want people to ask themselves the question, what is food for? Mm -hmm. And if food is to make profit for a small number of people, then we have a great food system. But if food is to have less impactful agriculture and support nutritional health among as many people as possible, then then we're not doing a good job of it. Mm -hmm. So one key moment in the story you tell is uh, kind of right after the Black Death, there aren't as many peasants in Europe and the nobility turns to uh, to trade to get more revenue and they make communal lands private for animal pasture. Uh, but meat at this, at this stage is something that's too expensive for most peasants. And there's a quote in the book, peasants were losing lands to animals that they couldn't eat and work in soil that was decreasingly productive, yet their numbers were growing. How exactly was that supposed to work? So why is this moment important and how did it end up working? I mean, that, I remember writing that line, how exactly was this supposed to work? Because it's like, it is this puzzle. It's like you take land away from people so they can't grow food for themselves. And you have them grow food that they can't afford. Mm -hmm. um, and their numbers, furthermore, their numbers are increasing because after all the Black Death, I mean, no one really knows how many people died in the plague, but at least a third of the population of Europe and maybe more. So, um, so population was bound to grow it at that point. So how was that supposed to work? No one, uh, no one really gave that. There wasn't an organized structure for figuring that out, let's say. So the, the most aggressive, ruthless, um, exploitative people took over and, and figured out how to use this situation to their advantage. Um, I think the best example best worst example of how this worked out is what, what we call the Irish potato famine, which um, could have been called the, the British starvation of Ireland project just as accurately, because that's kind of what happened. And the, the British took land away from the Ireland was essentially a colony, all but a colony of, of England at that point, we're talking about the 19th century. Um, and we can go back if you want to and talk about colonialism and imperialism, but, but the Irish potato famine in the late 1840s um, came about because uh, much land was privatized. Irish peasants were living on an average of a quarter of an acre per family, which is not nothing, but it's not a lot. Uh, they had discovered, or the potato had firmly entrenched itself in Europe and, and Irish, uh, farmers and peasants were uh recognized the advantages of growing potatoes and you know potatoes it's funny i have a bad reputation right now but it's a the potato is a terrific food and i talk about that a little bit um and the population of ireland since irish people began eating potatoes the population became healthier and more numerous and um yeah healthier and more numerous but there was nothing else that they were growing, um, and they were only growing one kind of potato that was particularly sensitive to this um, to this blight. Uh, and so they began to go hungry and began to starve. And the British, uh, the British answer was to put people in in what amounted to workhouses, um, and so they were having starving people work for food and there wasn't enough work and there still wasn't enough food and starving people don't have a lot of energy as makes perfect mm -hmm. sense. And, and people were dying. So in a population of 8 million was the population of Ireland, uh, 1 million died or were permanently disabled and another million left mostly for the United States, which of course changed the course of history in the United States too. Um, and those kind that was the first that was kind of the first politically motivated famine and the british did not set out to starve the irish but once that starvation began they did very little to stop it and it was their actions in the first place that that gave it great great impetus but 
in the century that followed, and we still see it occasionally, although less and less and less. Um, Amartya Sen at some point said, every famine is a political famine. Um, and that wasn't the case before 1850. But from then on, every famine has been preventable. And that's because there is enough food. So um, it's really a question of can can people afford that food? And sometimes it's a question of distribution. People say, oh, well, it's distribution. And sometimes there are corrupt warlords who are stealing food or the UN or the Red Cross or whatever can't get food to starving people. But mostly it's just simply a question of money. And And if you want to sort of demonstrate that, to yourself, just imagine yourself anywhere in the world with a couple hundred bucks in your pocket, and you know you're going to find food because you have a couple hundred bucks in your pocket. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to back up what happened in the 15th and 16th century, was the Europe? I mean, this is common knowledge the Europeans began to quote unquote explore the rest of the world, and they weren't the only, the Chinese could have done the same thing, but the Chinese didn't need land as badly as the Europeans did. The Europeans needed land, and of course they wanted wealth, and yes, they wanted to find out how to get more spices, but that's about money. Um, and that that led to all the horrible consequences of the 15th and 16th, or, or mostly 16th century, um, in North and South America, the genocide of of indigenous people and everything that came along with that. I don't know that we need to detail that. And no one would say this was only about getting land for agriculture, but it was in large part about getting land for agriculture. Land is something that comes up in this book again and again. In the United States, we have what you're talking about in which land is effectively stolen by the government from the indigenous people who lived there for you know, very, very long time. And then once it's taken, it's given away or sold for cheap, specifically to white settlers. And, you know, as, as the history of the United States progresses, specifically not uh, given away or sold for cheap to uh, black Americans. Or women. Or women. Um, so what, and honestly, it, it reads sort of like a case for reparations, that part of the book, what are, cause what are the effects sort of, of basically giving a lot of land for cheap to white guys? I mean, it better read like a case for rep reparations. Cause I intended, I intended to read mm -hmm. as a, not only as a case for reparations, but as a case for federally mandated land reform, which I think we're 10 or 50 or even a hundred years away from, but is inevitable um, or well, Nothing's inevitable, but I like to think it's inevitable. Um, yeah, I mean, the 19th century. So if if the land was stolen in the 16th and 17th century, in the 18th and especially 19th centuries, it was given. In the 18th century, it was given to the citizens of the crown, friends of the, of the king. Um, usually the way that before the Revolutionary War, the way that that uh white men were given land was th through their town through their parish through connections with the king through uh laws that that made it so that white men who were the only people who were recognized as citizens both before and after the revolutionary war um were able to get land but after the you know the real opportunity in this country and it goes for land and so many other things, the real opportunity for this country to be the democracy that our rhetoric says we would like to be was Reconstruction. Um, and for some period of time, but only a couple of years, um, black people were able to uh, have, a, have a, a start at running their own lives, at determining their own future, at, uh, at, at, acting as a majority when they were the majority without, without fear. And that was short lived. And, uh, you know, we don't know what would have happened if Lincoln hadn't been assassinated, but the current reading of history is that Andrew Johnson, in fact, 
wasn't the worst president we've ever had. I mean, that he would have been supplanted by Trump by now anyway, so he'd only be second worst. But there was some support from Andrew um, Andrew Johnson on the on the um, of Reconstruction, and uh, but we know what happened, and Reconstruction was overturned, and land was given almost one hundred percent to white settlers, st- stolen from Native Americans earlier on, and then given by the government to white settlers uh, and to railroads or or other oligarchical enterprises. Um, those white settlers naturally left their land to their descendants. Much of it was consolidated, but it was consolidated from white people to white people. Um, and the result is that we have concentration of huge tracts of lands in the hands of white men and white men's descendants. Obviously, some of it's been corporatized, but the corporations are run and owned by white men also. And never was there a chance for women, black people, immigrants uh, to get in on this land rush. I mean, a little bit, but 5%. Um, I don't want to make it sound like it was in, in 100%, but, but, but close to it. And the argument is that obviously, again, another long story, but there's a, a strong argument that Americans that America's economic success in the 20th century was in large part due to the slavery of the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries. Um, <coughs> and so if you think that, that as, yeah. as many people do, if you think that, that the success and wealth of this country was built on the, ba- on the backs of, uh, especially in, enslaved Africans, but um, immigrants from Asia, from from the South, South, what became South America, Mexico, uh, and even even the poor people of Europe. This wealth was built on the backs of those people, and most of those people were shut out um, from the great land rush of the late nineteenth and early twentieth centuries, and. The source of most wealth in this world is land. I mean, some of that is mining, but a lot of it, much of it is mining, but even more of it is agriculture. Um, and and that wealth was outright given to white people, including former slave owners. So people who should have been punished, not rewarded. What would land reform look like or... I mean, I could tell you one fantasy, but I am not a policy wonk. I am not mm-hmm. someone who writes policy or knows how how to make policy. But but um, there is some precedent for there is precedent for taxing estates on the death of the owner of the estate. Um, we do have estate tax, and and one could argue that. If land was given away by the federal government, then land can be controlled. The passing on of that land can be controlled by federal government. So one could say, on your death, 5% of your land, 10% of your land is turned over to the state or is um, is held as agricultural land to be run by people who want to do agriculture well or even is uh, used as reparations for people who've suffered at the hands of those those pe- people who owned those great swaths of land. I'm, it's possible to figure this out. I'm not the person to figure it out. I can, <laughs> I can play around with it and say, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? Um, it, it's never going to be left up to me, nor should it be. But, but one can imagine ways in which in which land can be transferred into the hands of people who deserve it and who want to farm it and want to farm it well, uh, and who were never given the opportunity to do that. So another big story in your book is a basically collusion to some degree between corporate interests and uh, willing government interests and entities. Uh, Maybe my favorite 
anecdote is the story about how Heinz ketchup took off. Um, do you do you remember that one? I mean, uh, uh, what what I know is that Henry Heinz was smart enough to recognize that labeling and and being quote unquote honest about the ingredients in your food could be used to your advantage as a businessman as opposed to your disadvantage. So um government government labeling was never in favor of full transparency, but it did say you have to you have to put you have to list the additives that you're putting into your ingredient into your product and and Henry Hines was um the first to recognize that if everybody had a, an evil sounding chemical in their product, except, and he managed to figure out how to make ketchup without it. And he did. Um, he said partly through adding a lot of sugar. Right. In, in part through adding a lot of sugar. I did forget that part. He would have a leg up. And as a result, Heinz, Heinz what the chemical is sodium benzoate. I can't even remember now. Pretty sure the chemical was sodium benzoate, but it may have been so. something else. Um, by taking that out, by figuring out how to take that chemical out of his ketchup and make make a sort of uniform product, uh, and and Dayton's right, it it was done with the aid of sugar. Um, sugar fixes a lot of things in food. He took over he took over the spot as the number one ketchup maker and and built a a dominant food processing industry as a result. Mm-hmm. There. That still, you know, that happened. That happens recently. You know, government says, well, you have to label your, your or you can label your product as heart healthy. And suddenly everybody takes out the cholesterol or adds fiber or whatever to their product. But it it can still be junk food. It just doesn't do that particular thing. This is mm-hmm. um, this is a kind of direct result of oversimplifying matters or what what's probably best called reductionism, which is to to look at things based on their components rather than what they actually are or what they actually do. So there was a very famous study, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, that looked at beta carotene, which is thought to be one of the beneficial components of many vegetables, carrots especially, um, gives carrots their orange color. Um, and the study isolated beta carotene and fed a lot of it to people and they got sick. And it was like, this is not proof that carrots are bad for you. This is, this is proof that extracting one component of a food and saying this is harmful or this is beneficial or this is not harmful or this is not beneficial. Um, that's not the way to look at things. The way to look at things is, is what kind of diet makes sense. And we, have not been able to to do that as a our government has not been able to do that. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so one of the the stats you mentioned is that the the US like food advertising budget is 14 billion dollars and the chronic disease prevention budget is 1 billion dollars. Yeah, I think it's actually um, worse than that. I don't, but okay. I, you know, statistics, you can fiddle with them. I, I sometimes say if the public health community spent as much on public relations as the, as the um, junk food world, it would run out of money. If it spent it at the same rate, it would run out of money on January 1st every year. But whatever it is, the budget uh-huh. for marketing junk food is many, many times uh, the budget for assuring for, for assuring that people know what good public health standards are. Right. I mean, of so, course, the government doesn't even really acknowledge or know what a good what a good diet is. It's been it's been pumping out bad information and bad dietary advice for fifty years. It's not as bad as it used to be. It is better, but it's much more complicated and and convoluted than it needs to be. What are some of the problems with the advice today? Look, I can sum up what a good diet is in 15 seconds. Um, Go for maybe it. Maybe 10. And and a, a good diet is little or no junk food, as many plants as possible and close to their natural form, uh, and way fewer animal products than we currently eat. So 
that does it. Keep that stuff in mind, then you have a good diet. Who eats little or no junk food? Almost no one. Who's cutting back on their animal product consumption? Almost no one. Who's eating more plants than they used to eat? Well, people do eat somewhat more in the way of fruits and vegetables than they used to eat. But junk food is junk food is just it's the way our agriculture, I mean, it goes back to what we were talking about a half an hour ago. Our agriculture, which is based on profit and on yield, produces the ingredients that are best suited for making junk food. And so what's out there to buy, the affordable food in the United States, tends to be junk food. And the food that's driving the public health crisis, the food that's making people sick, is junk food. So it almost doesn't matter what government's advice is. What matters is what's in the market. And we all know what supermarkets look like. They're 40 to 80 percent, depending on how you count, and they're 40 to 80 percent food that's bad for you. And the the best study I know of says 60 percent of our available calories are in the form of ultra-processed food. Ultra-processed food is a fancy term for junk food. So the majority of our calories are junk food. How, that means that the majority of calories we eat are junk food. And it's not like we're given a choice. If we all decided tomorrow that we're eating nothing but plant-based food and, and pasture-raised meat, or forget the meat, we're eating nothing but fruits and vegetables, we'd run out of fruits and vegetables the day after tomorrow. So we don't <laughs> grow enough fruits and vegetables uh -huh. to feed our to feed our people. Yeah, there's a a response people sometimes have to government interfere. You know, if you propose their land reform or government should subsidize good foods or government should take more action to make sure we produce better foods that, oh, like you can't have the government interfere in the market like that. Um, but kind of the part of how we ended up with our current, uh, you know, high meat, high sugar, high junk production of food is – because that's what some of the subsidies and incentives are to grow. Right. Um, so I know you're not a, a policy guy, you said, but what what could the government do kind of big picture to start incentivizing a, a better food system where what's what's affordable and available for people is actually stuff that's going to encourage our health and not destroy the earth? I mean, again, it's, it, is, it is like asking me about land reform. I can... Um... I can say what I think is possible and can happen, but it doesn't it doesn't mean other people are going to think it's reasonable or possible. Um, we subsidized the production of junk food just as we subsidized the the giveaway of land. Um, if we started incentivizing the production of fruits and vegetables, and part of that I think is land reform. I think this is all tied mm -hmm. together, um, and we made those fruits and vegetables available to more people affordably in more places, um, we'd have a healthier population. So how how might we do that? Put land into the hands of people who want to farm it well, incentivize everybody to farm better, including, um, I mean, the reason that industrial farmers grow corn and soybeans is not because they're in love with corn and soybeans, because they get paid to grow corn and soybeans. If you paid them to grow whatever, broccoli and <laughs> broccoli and tomatoes and apples and whole grains and so on and and set up a system that was able to process and market those things affordably, then they'd be more available to more people. I mean, all the evidence is that people buy fast food and junk food because it's convenient, it's easy, it's cheap. Uh, we've grown accustomed to it. This is not an overnight project, but we can make real food easy and inexpensive and more widely available and we can accustom ourselves to the flavors of of real food all of this is possible all of this has been done um for some periods of time in some places and um if we want agriculture that's not probably the worst agriculture for our planet possible and producing probably the worst kind of food we we could then we need a system that addresses these issues. And it, I I think the most interesting thing I've learned in the last 10 years, I think, is that it's it all starts with agriculture. This stuff is is based on 
how we treat the land, what we grow, um, and what we do with it, and or how we grow it. And those things are choices. If we if we if we said our job is to steward the land to make sure that there's that there's a planet for people a hundred and two hundred years from now to thrive on, if that were our primary goal then we would go about doing agriculture in a much different way. And if we went about doing agriculture in a much different way, um, then we'd be eating better as well. So you mentioned reductionism earlier and how um, you're, you're resistant in the book to the idea that everything can be understood simply as the sum of its component parts. And you brought up nutrition as an example where you know the overall health impact of a carrot isn't necessarily the same as having a deconstructed carrot. Extracted. Yes. Yeah. Um, but you also talk about this in terms of how soil and ecosystems function. Um, and one of the things that you're excited about in the book are what are called agroecological farms, where rather than a monoculture where you try to uh, not only um, exclude other crops besides your corn and your soy, but any really any other life form. Life, yeah. <laughs> um, that there are other ways of growing food that are sort of more, uh, perhaps more chaotic, but also more diverse uh, sets of of living beings on the land. Some of which you're growing for food, some of your, which you're growing for other purposes, some of which are are drawn to the food and and have other positive impacts. Um, so, yeah, I guess. I know you you spent time paint for us a picture of what these agroecological farms look like and why you're excited about them. Well, the great thing is that they can look like they can look like anything. Um, hmm. And the first time, uh, this is actually let me tell this a little differently. I went to a photo exhibit a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, um, and the woman had traveled around Europe taking pictures of traditional sustainable farms that still existed or that were new following following some traditional rules. And they all look different. And many of them, and I had this experience once myself. Well, now I've had it many times, but I can remember the first time. Many farms that operate under the principles of agroecology, which let's just say we can also call we'll get into why agroecology goes farther than just plain sustainability or regenerative agriculture. But in its simplest form, it's about regenerative agriculture. Um, if you go to a farm that, that practices those kinds of principles, it may look like a forest. It may look like mm. a tradition. It may look like a very, very beautiful row crop farm with many different plants and lots of biodiversity um, but it also may look like the woods. And the first time I was taken to a, let's say, agroecological farm in, in Mexico, but a, a traditional, a traditional kind of agricultural style, I was like, "Where's the farm?" And the guy was like, <laughs> "You're standing in the middle of it. We got papaya over here. We got this over here. We got that over here, and you don't see it because you're just looking at eighteen different plants or a thousand different plants, and you're surrounded mm -hmm. by it." I will say that the reason I want to say um, agroecology is not a sexy word, clearly, um, <laughs> but and it's not something that everybody's going to like. Cereal makers are not going to put it on their boxes, although maybe that's a good thing. Um, but the real principles of agroecology go farther than regenerative farming because they do take into account how farm workers are treated, how food system workers in, in general are treated, um, how the land is projected to, to look 10 and 50 years down the road, the kind of food that is produced and so on. So it's not just about a closed, a closed circuit of a closed loop of farming where everything is returned to the soil, which is important, but it's about, it's about returning nutrients to the soil 
but it's also about how are farm workers treated? How is food transported? What kind of food is being grown? What is food cost? Is it nutritious? And so on down the line. All the important issues in food, agroecology addresses, tries to address all of them. While we're talking about important issues in food, um, so as as you know, as we've, as we've as we've talked about before, my argument is that so long as we have sustain, sustainable and healthy plant food, uh, there's there's no good reason to kill animals for food, even if you do treat them nicely. Um, but in the actual agricultural system the United States has, we very much don't treat them nicely anyway. So how did we get this rapid rise of the meat industry in the last century and how did it become so brutal? Well, I guess the simple answer to that is quote unquote efficiency. I mean, we, not we, but they learned how to, they learned how to keep animals in um, intense captivity, let's say, in factory farms. And it began with chickens. Um, which are which are pretty easy to pack tightly, and then it continued uh, with hogs, um, and now it's not uncommon uncommon to have chicken quote unquote farms with hundreds of thousands of birds and hog farms with hog and cattle farms with tens of thousands of of animals, and it's um. It can only be done if you don't take into account the environmental consequences, the moral consequences, the the conse the the effect this has on the animals themselves. Um, it's immoral. It's uh, unecological. It's it's damaging not only to the environment but to the to the people and animals that live around these kinds of factories um, uses way more resources that can be justified. There's, um, I mean, if there's one good thing about it, you could say, well, it provides adequate protein for a lot of people. And um, that is true, but so would the farming of legumes provide adequate protein mm -hmm. for many people without any of these really horrible, I mean, these. this is the biggest um, I mean, you and I disagree about whether meat should be food at all, but it's a trivial disagreement compared to the, um, I think it's a trivial disagreement. You might not, I don't want to insult you. Um, but compared to the, to the numbers of animals that, that we're killing, whose lives we completely, uh, discount the amount of resources that they're, they're using. If, the, if there were a number one change that could be made in the food system, today something that would have the broadest impact across the whole landscape i would say it's the way in which we raise animals you have to to change that you also have to convince people to eat again here's where you and i disagree maybe not no meat but but way less meat um and and not encourage people who've who on their traditional diets ate some meat or some fish or some of each and now think that the the way to define yourself as successful is to eat as much of those things as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the as as part of this podcast project, we're doing a uh, a book club for Patreon subscribers. And we we just read we talked about this book, uh, The Great Derangement by Amitav Ghosh. And he sort of talks about how the the US and the West set this standard of living and image of what like you know of what living in wealth looks like uh and then the rest of the world is finding out if everyone actually lived that way right then none of us could right right uh that it would just destroy the earth well i mean i remember 10 15 years ago saying things like uh it's not it's not that the Chinese should be able to eat more like Americans. It's that Americans should be able to eat more like the Chinese. Well, you can't say that anymore. I mean, it's a silly mm -hmm. thing to say because so the Chinese diet has changed so much. The Mediterranean diet barely exists. Children in the Mediterranean don't eat the Mediterranean diet. Some, mm -hmm. some lingering grown ups do, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe 
two last quick questions. Um, one is just as a as a writer, um, I think it's interesting that this is a book challenging capitalism, challenging growth, challenging many of the ideas that are, um, I think, fairly central to the U.S. economic system and, and what is acceptable in political discourse, or at least what was acceptable a few years ago. Right. Um, but it's also, I don't know, you, you got blurbed by by socialists and by you know, re relatively mainstream politicians. And I think it's written in a way that's accessible to people who aren't card-carrying communists or, or something coming in. Um, so, so how do you approach making, I guess, what could be considered radical arguments um, in a way that hopefully, uh, you know, reaches people well beyond, you know, people who maybe just liked your cookbooks? Right. Well, I think the argument's incremental. Uh, so if you like my cookbooks, you will notice that they start with real ingredients. And maybe you start to wonder where real ingredients come from or why more people aren't cooking. And that gets into the questions about the food system. And once mm -hmm. you start asking questions about the food system, if they're answered properly, it really shouldn't take you too long before you realize that the food system doesn't stand alone. That it's when you start addressing the food system, you're addressing ecology, you're addressing income inequality, you're addressing a public health crisis, you're addressing not only historical race issues, but current race issues and so on down the line. And so it's not that radical to say we should be eating more plants. Um, but if you start asking questions around how we're eating or why we, why, you know, I can say we can't be eating more plants. There just aren't enough plants in the mm -hmm. system for us to all be eating more plants. Well, why is that? You're kind of off and running. I mean, you started this conversation at the end of the conversation by saying, why is yield not important? And and mm -hmm. yield, I'll end this conversation or begin to end this conversation by saying what I said a while ago, there is a question that needs to be answered. And the question is, what is food for? And again, if food is for making profit, then fine, you're in support of the of the existing food system. But if food is to steward the land uh, and and try to raise as much high quality, nutritious food for as many people as possible, then we're not doing very well. And how do we do better is also a question of income inequality and public health mm -hmm. and race and gender and all the other issues that you know you and I have talked about mm -hmm. in times that we haven't talked about food. So one last question uh, about how it's connected to all that. Um, food and ag seem like such important issues. Uh, and there are a lot of organizations and communities who are um, trying to improve our system. Uh, but even with all the environmental and public health uh, consequences, it's not something we're hearing about it, you know, in, in presidential debates a couple of years ago or that's yet sort of broken into, uh, you know, the even people who talk about climate, ag is usually pretty low on their list. Um, where, where do you see, uh, you can take this in two ways, either um, what would you encourage people to, to do or groups they can participate in if they're excited about this, um, and or why aren't, uh, the powers that be taking this more seriously at this point. I mean, there is more discussion about food than there used to be. Um, I, I think, I do think that's true. And I think more mm -hmm. awareness and even, I mean, I'm with you in, in saying climate activists have long ignored agriculture, but they're ignoring agriculture less as it becomes mm -hmm. clearer and clearer that industrial agriculture is a big contributor to climate change. So, you know, I could say it's gotten a little better in the last few years. Having said that, I also do despair of it. I I wonder also why people don't talk more about food. And I, I think to some extent that's because we are both within 10 minutes of a market where we can buy a mango or a tomato or just about anything else that we want. And we mm -hmm. can afford to do that. And most Americans are in that same position. Um I don't, you, could, you can't really put a number on it, but let's say 60% or 80% of Americans 
are within a quick drive of a supermarket where there's any food you can imagine. That's a pretty incredible thing. So it's not hard to say, well, the food system kind of works. You just have to look a little more closely. And um, part of the problem with politicians is that presidential primaries begin in Iowa, and and there's a lot of power unfairly vested in unpopul- relatively unpopulated states that, that are dependent on the industrial food system. And so suggesting that we change the whole food system is often suicidal for politicians. Um, that's something we have to figure out. But But – that's another perfect example. I have to end here, but it is another perfect example of how you can't talk about the food system without talking about bigger issues because now we're at the point where we want to talk about, or I'm at the point where I want to talk about abolishing the Senate, which is not exactly a food issue. And yet the existence right. of the Senate, the existence of all that power concentrated in all those states that have very few people living in them, um, and many of which have powerful agricultural corporate interests. Right. Right. So, yeah, thank you for coming on the show. The book is Animal Vegetable Junk. That was Mark Bittman. Thanks for having me, Dayton, and it's great to see you. Thank you so much for listening. That was Mark Bittman, the author of Animal Vegetable Junk. If you enjoyed this episode or this podcast, please rate and review us. Um, you can also sign up for my email list. Uh, The link is in the episode description, uh, which will give you each new episode in your inbox the day it comes out. So wouldn't that be neat? Um, If you want to support uh, this interview and others like it, please consider um, becoming a supporter on Patreon. Again, the link is below. And regardless of whether you do any of that, I hope you have a wonderful day.